So we've uh, talked about how a star is formed. Um, the critical piece to, to uh, take away from that is that uh, you have to have fusion for a star to be a star. Um, beyond that, though, uh, stars are going to behave differently according to how much mass they have. And so for the next uh, several pages, what we're going to talk about is how that mass breaks out in, into their, their behaviors, or how their lives are lived. And we're going to go right up through the, uh, the life of a star up to the point where it becomes elderly. So on page 63, we have pre-main sequence solar mass breakout. Um, so if you have a star or a pre-main sequence star, I should say, that is less than uh, 0.08 solar masses, It has insufficient mass to uh, trigger hydrogen fusion. Remember, mass equals gravity, and gravity equals pressure. So there is a threshold that has to be met. So if it's less than 0 0.08 solar masses, uh, it's not going to deliver enough pressure to trigger that hydrogen fusion. What you get is something called a brown dwarf. A brown dwarf is uh, also frequently referred to as a failed star. Okay. Now what are these brown dwarfs? Well, they're gas giants. And uh, they are primarily hydrogen and helium. <clears throat> and they do generate some heat due to compression. Remember, if you're going to have pressure, you're going to have heat. So they do generate some heat. and friction. Um, in some cases, these brown dwarfs can do a very limited amount of fusion with, uh, with uh, hydrogen isotopes, but that's a whole different uh, separate uh, topic uh, that gets pretty dense and we're not gonna go there. Just, the broad, in, just in broad general terms, Less than 0 0.08 solar masses, uh, insufficient mass to trigger fusion. You wind up with a brown dwarf, otherwise known as a failed star. They're gas giants, primarily hydrogen and helium, and they do generate some heat because there is some mass there, and there is going to be some pressure, and therefore there will be some heat. Now, uh, stars that are greater than seven solar masses... They have no pre-main sequence phase. Pre-main sequence phase.
And the reason for that is the mass is sufficient to go directly from a protostar to fusion. Re remember, you know, this is a lot of mass here. So uh, the more mass, the quicker we get to that fusion process. So they, they just kind of zip right through. So the mass is sufficient. And then we do have uh, theoretic upper limits for, uh, uh, for stellar mass. We think, we think uh, that the upper limits of stellar mass are, are somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, somewhere around 120 solar masses. Originally hypothesized at 120 solar masses, recent observations indicate indicate that they may get up to uh, somewhere around 130 to 150 solar masses. So we're still learning things. You know, this is a, a work in progress. Now, what I want to do is uh, pause at this point and talk about this term, uh, main sequence. It, uh, it's important that you get a handle on this one. So you've got some clear space on the uh, left, hand, left hand side of your notebook. So we'll take some notes the old fashioned way. And I'm going to introduce another term here, something called hydrostatic equilibrium. So, main sequence stars are stars in which Hydrogen fusion, and I'm going to emphasize core. Core hydrogen fusion is at a nearly constant rate. big takeaway here is that a main sequence star is a star in which 
the fusion is taking place in the core and that that fusion is hydrogen fusion, okay? Hydrogen fusion in the core. That's what we mean by a main sequence star, all right? Number two. Outward thermal pressure of fusion is in balance with the inward pressure of gravity. Outward thermal pressure of fusion is in balance with the inward pressure of gravity, and this balance is sufficient to support all layers above the core. support rather to support okay and yes stars are layered just like an onion and that may seem to, uh, to, to suggest that, uh, that there's some type of a solid nature to it. No, no, a star is gases and, it, and it's fluid, but fluid does go in layers. And that's not all that unusual. It happens in oceans, happens in lakes, happens in the atmosphere. So why should a star be any different? Yeah, stars have layers. All right, so this is what we're talking about, uh, a main sequence star. It is in hydrostatic equilibrium and and it has core hydrogen fusion going on core hydrogen fusion all right that's what makes a star main sequence now one other thing while we're doing some additional notes here i want to talk about star classification using the hr or hertzsprung russell uh diagram and I'm going to post a video that talks about that, but star classification now normally when I broach this topic in class, I have people bust out their textbooks. Um, uh, obviously, I can't do that here, so what I will do is I'll, I'll find a video that I can post that will, that will uh, lay this out. But the, the HR diagram, uh, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, uh, classifies stars according to their luminosity and their temperature, and there's also a correlation with their size as well. And along the main sequence, the classifications are O, B, A, F, G, K, M. At this end, we have blue giants. Super hot. And at this end, we have red dwarfs. 
very cool, very dim. Um, and that's us. Our sun is a class G star. And uh, there's a time-honored mnemonic to remember this classification system. It's a bit sexist, but it has also stood the test of time. And the way to remember star classification, every astronomy student learns this one, it goes like this. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. That's how you remember star classification. Okay, so continuing on, we'll talk about uh, H2 regions. H2 regions, these are also regions uh, uh, of star formation, and uh, this is where we get to emission nebula, and they are characterized by ionized hydrogen. Now, to ionize an atom means to strip the electrons from that atom. Now, since hydrogen has only one electron, what we have are hydrogen atoms with no electrons. This is where we get into regions of high mass stars, spectral types O and B. Okay, uh, and good examples of, of uh, these uh, these. Uh, Type O and type B stars, these are the blue giants that I was talking about. The Pleiades is a beautiful example of that. Um, the surface temperatures of these stars can range from 15,000 to 35,000 Kelvins. And this is high enough to emit ultraviolet radiation. Now remember, we talked about uh, wavelengths and frequencies uh, of light. When we get into ultraviolet, we're talking about high frequency, short wavelengths. And remember, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy in electromagnetic radiation. So this is why we get sunburned from ultraviolet, okay? It's high energy stuff. It's bad juju. And in this case, the ultraviolet is intense enough to ionize hydrogen, UV, will ionize hydrogen. Type O stars can ionize hydrogen at a distance of 30 light years. So yeah, that's some pretty hot stuff. Okay, now, back to the atomic processes. Now, this is, I've mentioned this earlier, and you're going to hear me talk about this a lot more as we get into what really goes on inside a star. You cannot really understand cosmology without understanding how stars work. And you can't understand how stars work without having some appreciation of how atoms work. 
Um, so, this ionizing process, as electrons recombine with hydrogen nuclei, That would be protons. They emit photons as they move toward the ground state. We've talked about this earlier. We talked about where do photons come from? Well, photons come from electrons. Remember, photons are electron poop, okay? So as these photons, as these uh, electrons rather, recombine with their nuclei, that means that they have to dump energy to do that. And to dump that energy, they have to emit photons. So this deionizing process, that's what this is called, this deionizing process, <coughs> causes uh, an emission of photons at uh, a pretty high frequency in, in short wavelength. Now, um, and so they, they'll emit photons as they uh, move toward ground state. This would be called decreasing excitation. As that happens, hydrogen emits a reddish glow. Uh, which is uh, typical of a newborn star cluster. Now, uh, recall also, we discussed this earlier, different elements are going to emit different colors according to whatever their atomic structure is because they're going to have different types of electron shells. So, for instance, hydrogen emits uh, visible light at... Six hundred and fifty six nanometers nanometers. Okay, that would be six fifty six times ten to the negative nine meters. Okay, that's the wavelength. Oxygen emits a greenish glow. Oxygen wavelength would be somewhere around 501 nanometers or 
this wavelength, it's going to look greenish. And so, yeah, when we look at objects like a, uh, like a planetary nebula, for instance, and we see a lot of green, uh, that's a good indicator of oxygen. That's how we can, that's one of the ways that we can say, ah, there's probably some oxygen there. Okay, so, yeah, these colors are going to be uh, good chemical indicators for us. All right, so more coming up on the next page. We'll pause here.